Okay, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Well, it's a pity that last time our internet connection got interrupted and we could not complete the lecture. So I'll uh, start from where we left off the last time. And we were in the middle of uh, stating and proving this proposition here, this proposition, which I'm going to underline. So let me do it in uh, red ink. So this is the proposition which we were in the process of stating. So here you have a, the hypotheses are that you have a field K, which is complete for a discrete valuation. And then you have a finite extension L of K. We have seen that L itself carries a unique valuation extending the valuation on K and moreover L is complete for that valuation and that valuation is also discrete. We have attached two invariants or two numbers to this finite extension L of K. So here V is the valuation on K and W is the valuation on L. And the two numbers were E, W over V. We could have also called it E, L over K and F, L over K. Maybe that would have been better. But in any case, you have the number E, uh, W over V which is called the ramification index and the number F W over V, which is called the residual degree. So F by definition, F L over K is by definition, the degree of K L, the residue field of L over K K, the residue field of K. And we'll come to, so we, okay, so that, that that defines these two numbers E and F, the ramification index and the residual degree. And the statement of the proposition is that the degree of the extension L over K is equal to the product of the ramification index and the residual degree. The degree L over K is E times F. The second part says that this OV um, is of course a ring and OW is also a ring. It's an OV algebra. We could have called them OL and OK as well. So OL is an OK algebra. And this part here gives you the structure of OK, OL, sorry, or OW as it's called here as a module over OV. It says that it's a free module of rank equal to the degree of the extension L over K, right? So let's start proving this. Let's um, simplify the notation and use just E and F for E L over K and F L over K. And by definition, this E is the constant by which you have to multiply the group WL star. WL star is isomorphic to Z and WK star is a subgroup. So every subgroup of Z is E times Z for some E. And the E here is the ramification index. This is more or less the definition. Okay, so we have this VK star is E times WL star. And <clears throat> mm, right. And you have take a uniformizer pi w of um, of L. So we could have also called it pi L because it's a uniformizer of L. And 
when I look at this question, WL star modulo VK star, I have this as a system of generators. What? I have one pi L pi L squared all the way up to pi L to the power E minus one. Huh? So that's what is being said. I goes from zero to E minus one. And these pi W I, pi W is the same as pi L. Huh? This is, these powers of this uniformizer form a system of representatives of W L star modulo V K star because this is basically E times, because this is E times W L star and W L star is generated by, by the, by pi, uh, what is it? Pi L bar, so to speak. Hmm? Well, so we are taking a system of representatives, huh? One in each coset. Fine. Now, <clears throat> I'm also taking F elements of the ring OW such that the images in the residue field form a KV basis of this as a vector space over this. The dimension of K W as a vector space over KV is by definition, it's F. So I'm choosing F elements in, uh, I got have first chosen them in, in KW and taken their lifts in OW. Okay, so this way I, I have these e, EF elements, omega J times pi W to the power I. J, I and J are varying. I goes from zero to E minus one and J goes from one to F. Okay, so I have these EF elements and what are these elements of? These are elements of uh, L, um, yeah, that's it. They are elements in L. The first claim is that these elements are K linearly independent. Okay, I have to show that what I'll show huh, is that we'll show that they form a K basis of L. That will prove that the degree of L over K is equal to E times F because there are EF elements here. So that will establish the first claim. Now in order to show, show that they form a basis, I have to show that they are linearly independent and that they generate L. So first let's show that they are linearly independent. If they're not, then I can find scalars hmm, indexed by the same set by which these, these vectors, so to speak, huh, these vectors here, the, these things, they are vectors in, in the vector space L. So I can find scalars Aij such that this linear combination, and the scalars are not all zero, such that this linear combination is equal to zero. Okay, that's what it means for them to be linearly dependent. We are assuming that they are linearly dependent in order to get a contradiction and thereby showing that they are indeed linearly independent. Okay, now let me call this sum SI. Inside this, this sum here, I'll call it SI. So it is non-zero for some i, obviously, because if it had been zero, if this is zero for all i, then when I take the sum over all i, uh, no, no, wait a moment. No, no, so that's not the reason. The reason why they are non-zero is the following. 
it, it's here. It says that SI is non-zero whenever there is a J such that AIJ is non-zero. And there's always a J such that AIJ is non-zero. Or in other words, there is an I and a J such that AIJ is non-zero because our assumption is that these AIJs are not all zero. Okay, so th there is an I and a J such that AIJ is non-zero. And in that case, SI will have to be non-zero as well. Okay. Uh, because these things are KV linearly independent. Otherwise, I mean, if this, um, uh, if these SIs, oh, no, no, no. The SIs are just up to here, you know? This is, yeah, yeah, here, here are the SIs. So if there were, if, if all SI are equal to zero, then uh, what is happening here? So uh, this AIJ is non-zero and these omega i's are omega i j bars are linearly independent, kv linearly independent. So what do you want to see? Okay, so is this? Yeah, anyway, so the point is that it can be checked that whenever aij is non-zero, si is non-zero, okay? Fine. But I'm claiming that if SI is non-zero, then this W of SI is in the subgroup V of K star. W of SI normally is in the group W of L star, right? Because this SI is in L or rather L star, it's non-zero, right? Now, this is a group and this is a subgroup. No, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. This is a subgroup. So the claim that is being made is that this particular element here, which is in WL star, is actually in this subgroup VK star. If SI is non zero, yeah, otherwise W of SI doesn't even make sense. So let nu be an index such that V of AI nu is less than V of AIJ for all J, okay? Then SI mod divided by AI nu is a linear OV linear combination of the WJ with the coefficients of W nu. These, these are omegas actually with the coefficient of omega nu equal to one. Huh? Because whatever the coefficient is, I have divided by the same coefficient and therefore uh, the coefficient of W omega nu is now equal to one. So now let's reduce modulo the uniformizer pi w and what do we see? We see that um, si divided by ai nu is not congruent to zero modulo pi w since they are kv linearly independent and therefore this w of this thing has to be zero. I mean something is non-zero modulo the uniformizer means that its valuation has to be zero. And if the valuation of SI divided by something is zero, that is the valuation, um, valuation of um, W of C by D is of course equal to W of C minus W of D. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's gonna be, this is gonna be W of SI minus W of AI nu, 
that's equal to zero. But this thing is equal to V of AI nu because AI nu is actually in K star and V extends and the W extends the valuation V on K, right? So our claim that if SI is non-zero, then W of SI is equal to V of some element of K star. Now we have our assumption in order to get a contradiction was that this linear combination is zero, okay? So if it is zero, if the sum of I things is zero, then there has to be an index I such that uh, <clears throat> such that they, in fact, they, they have to be two distinct indices, alpha and beta, such that which have the same valuation. Because this is because if C plus D is equal to zero, hmm, these are two numbers in, or two elements of some field complete for a discrete valuation whose sum is zero, then W of C will have to be equal to W of D. I mean, if, in other words, if W of C is strictly less than W of D, then C plus D cannot be equal to zero hmm? because in this case, W of C plus D is actually equal to W of C, okay? And W of C um, I mean if C and W of C cannot be plus infinity. Okay, so <clears throat> let's come back to this. So they have to be two distinct indices alpha and beta, such that they have the corresponding terms have the same valuation, same valuation in W. Now, in view of the fact that W of S alpha s alpha and w of s beta s beta is here they are in v k star this this would imply that w of this uh, the exponent is alpha and beta alpha and beta they would be congruent to each other in this quotient group but that contradicts the hypothesis that these i's are all distinct mm? they are a system of representatives of this. So they are, the, these elements are k, v, k linearly independent. Next, we have to gen, show that they generate the OV module OW. So let's take the submodule generated by these elements by the omega j's, okay? That's n. And M is the module, submodule generated by these EF elements. There are F elements here and EF elements here. So in other words, this M is uh, N, that's, that corresponds to I equal to zero, plus pi W huh, times N, uh, wait on pi, what is this omega and is it pi or is it omega? And omega is, a, no, no, it's pi. Yeah, it's pi, it's pi here. Yeah, so that corresponds to i equal to one and all the way up to i going to e minus one. So m is equal to n plus pi w n plus so on, all the way up to pi w to the power e minus one times n. Hmm? So you have this submodule M, which is N plus so on by W E minus one times N. Okay. But now <clears throat> by definition, more or less, this O W is N, huh? this particular N plus pi w times o w. Why is that? 
because uh, k w over k v the basis is omega omega j bar they are a basis hmm? for j in 1 to f that's what is being said here that is the that's what impl implies that o w is n plus meaning modulo pi w i mean and this is what you get uh, you these omega j's generate o w okay so now let's plug back this equation the first equation here huh? so i can write o w as n plus pi w times n plus pi w o w and i then plug back this o w again here so in this way after a certain number of steps i'll get this expression here n plus pi w times n and so on all the way up to pi w to the power e times o w the one just before that is pi w to the power e minus 1 uh, n but then these first e terms give me m by definition that's what m is so i can write o w i've written o w as m plus pi w pi v o w it's not pi v here it's pi w pi w pi w here okay so <clears throat> now i can repeat this process huh? from here i can go to m plus pi w and now i write o w as m plus pi w so it's going to be o w no yeah it's going to be m plus pi w o w so i can this is m plus pi w m plus pi w squared o w hmm? but m plus pi w m is just m so this is m plus pi w squared uh, o w and i can continue like this i'll get o w is equal to m plus pi w to the power r o w for every r greater than one now this is exactly what it means for m to be dense in o w just as z is dense in z p hmm? it i'm also saying that the when you take the projections onto various um, modulo various powers of the uniformizer you get surjective maps just as z to zp modulo p to the n zp hmm? z to this that's a surjective map but it can also be checked that the m because it's finitely generated as a uh, ow module it's also closed in ow Sorry, is it pi v or pi w? Uh, let's see. Wait a moment. So let's clarify this. W what was this? Uh, well, that's right. That's right. There's somebody who is paying attention. That's very good. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. So uh, I'm happy that somebody is paying good attention. So this has to be pi v because of this relation. Right. So I'll write it in green. This pi v o w, it's pi v because I'm writing it for pi w to the power e times o w. That's because pi v is roughly pi w to the power e, up to a unit, up to an element of o w star, 
which makes no difference when you are generating an ideal. So yes, that has to be a V, that has to be a V, and that has to be a V as well. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> so I, what, yeah, so what have we proved? We have proved that um, this um, two things, the degree of L over K is equal to E times F and the O K module O L is free of rank E F. Okay, this is what. Yeah. And the, what are the hypotheses? K is complete for a discrete valuation. Discrete valuation, and L is a finite extension of K. And of course, E is the ramification index and F is the residual degree. Good. So we have the same situation here. L over K is a finite extension. And we have this norm map, which goes from L star to K star. And the norm of the units is of course a unit. So it induces a norm map from L star modulo O V O W star to K star modulo O V star. Hmm? Uh, remember that th this is canonically isomorphic to Z, and so is this. And so, in terms of Z, what is this map? This is a map of Z modules which are both isomorphic to Z. So it has to be multiplication by when I identify this with Z and this with Z, this map should turn out to be some integer. And the idea is that this is exactly the integer F. So it says the homomorphism C, and this is the name which was given to this homomorphism. C is the homomorphism here, uh, which makes this, makes this square commute. This is injective. Huh? And moreover, the image of C has index equal to F in the, in the target. Okay, let's prove this. We have to prove that it's injective. So let's take some element whose image is trivial. So X is an O W star. If the image is trivial, it means that the norm is in the units of K. Right, because um, C goes from L star modulo, I'll call it OL star, to OK star modulo, no, it's not OK star, it's K star, right? Goes to this, to K star modulo OK star. So if if this norm, the image of the norm in this quotient is trivial, then this norm has to belong to the units. Now, if it belongs to the unit, the units, then its valuation has to be zero. And the valuation of the norm of something is actually the valuation W of that, that thing. So W of X is zero. So X has to be in O. L star, right? We started with an X bar here, then lifted it to an X in L star and uh, so on. Then we had, it went to norm L over K of X in K star. And we saw that the hypothesis C of X bar equal to zero implies that um, this norm L over K X is an O K star. And finally, this implies that W of X is equal to zero. And this is the same as saying that X bar is equal to one. So, uh, this should not be, well, you know, this is, it should not be zero here because see these are, 
this group isomorphic to Z, but they are written multiplicatively. So uh, the, it should be one instead of zero, right? Okay. How about the index? So this um, is isomorphic to Z, and this is a subgroup. Uh, what is the index of this subgroup? So this is by definition generated by the image of some uniformizer. And this is generated by the image of some uniformizer of L here. So the image, the in index is the smallest in integer i such that this is the ith power of the generator of the big group. Now, so we have to determine what this i is. Okay, let's, so we get this relation anyway. So if I raise to the exponent e both sides, then I'll get this equal to this. But we have this. Huh? Basically, the eth power of the uniformizer of L is the uniformizer of, of uh, K up to a unit of L. Huh? So <clears throat> And if I apply C to pi V, then of course I get the nth power because the norm from L to K of pi V is equal to pi V to the power N, where N is the degree of L over K, right? So you get the conclusion that, um, so the, the, this relation, mm, this relation and this relation, I'm sure imply that n and n equal to ef imply that this has to be f here. So okay, basically what is happening is um, we have proved that this thing is ef. Okay, because because pi v or pi k generates this pi k bar and that goes to ef here or it goes to pi bar to the power ef more precisely and this goes to one here which this one goes to e here so this e has to go to what um, it has to go to ef in order for this diagram to commute right so one has to go to f and that is the whole point. That was what was to be proved. Okay. So <clears throat> now we we will, you know, actually we would uh, we are interested in the case where um, where this k is a finite extension of QP. That's the most interesting case. But k can also be k power series t, where k is a finite extension of fp. So this field is not perfect. Therefore, it might have some extensions which are not separable. And ah, but here we are assuming ah, yeah. But so in our situation, the residue field is finite. So it's perfect. And therefore, this assumption of separability of the residue fields is going to be satisfied in this, in the case in which we are interested. So it's not a serious assumption. It's not a serious um, thing to suppose that the residual extension is separable. Okay, so if it is separable, then you can write KW as KV adjoined some element. Uh, finite separable extensions are monogenic, as they say. So the proposition says that, I mean, I've chosen this alpha, then there exists a pair consisting of an X in OV. Is it X in OV? Why is it an OV? Of course not an OV. 
it has to be in OW. So X in OW, which lifts alpha, huh? because this KW is OW modulo PW. And I have my alpha here, so I'm choosing an X in OW, which goes to alpha upon reduction modulo PW. So the proposition is saying that there is some lift X of this given alpha and some polynomial with coefficients in OV, which is monic and of the same degree as the residual degree. Such that when I evaluate this polynomial at X, I get a uniformizer of L, okay? So that's the assumption, that's the assertion. That is what we have to prove. Okay, so how do we prove that? So we start with an arbitrary lift, not in OV, but in OW. And I take an arbitrary lift R, not arbitrary, not entirely arbitrary, but a monic polynomial R in OV of T, which lifts the more minimal polynomial of alpha over KV. Hmm? Remember, KW is equal to KV alpha. So it has some minimal, there's some minimal polynomial of alpha over KV. I'm not giving it a name, but I'm lifting it to a polynomial in OVT, uh, which is unitary. Of course, unitary in the sense of being monic. This mo minimal polynomial is, of course, a monic polynomial of degree what? Degree F, where F is the residual degree. Okay, so I've chosen an arbitrary lift X of alpha and, and any monic lift of the minimal polynomial of alpha over KV. So as I said, the degree of R is equal to the residual degree, fine. Now what is R of X congruent to modulo PV, PW? R of X, it has to be, um, R of X is congruent to R bar of X bar modulo PW, right? But R bar is the monic polynomial of alpha and alpha, X bar is alpha. So this is congruent to zero. And that is what is being said here. So the valuation of Rx has to be strictly greater than one, not strictly. I mean, it has to be greater than one. Strictly positive. Now, if it's equal to one, we are done because we wanted, we are claiming that there's something, uh, some element whose some Rx, R and X can be chosen so that Rx is a uniformizer of L. Now here, one has to be slightly careful, not, um, well, yeah, here's the proposition. So, W has to be normalized because I'm talking about the valuation. So W is such that KX star, it's surjective. Hmm? W of a uniformizer is equal to one. That's how you normalize this. So that's why I'm saying that if the valuation is equal to one, then it's a uniformizer. So we are done because we want some RX to be a uniformizer of L. What happens if W of Rx is strictly greater than one? Then I've, I take an arbitrary uniformizer pi W and I replace X by X plus pi W because X plus pi W bar is of course going to be equal to X bar or congruent if you wish and which is congruent to alpha mod PW, right? 
So this is x plus pi w is another lift of, of alpha. What is r of x plus pi w? Now remember we have been using this identity for evaluating a polynomial at a sum of two things. It's the value at the first thing times the derivative at the first thing times the second thing and something which, which is some multiple of the square of the second thing. Okay, I mean this is um, this is something which we used in the in the proof of Hensel's lemma as well. So there is some b in O W such that this identity holds. R of x plus pi w is equal to R of x plus R prime of x times pi w plus b times pi w squared. Now. As alpha is separable over kb, this r prime of x is not congruent to zero modulo pw, right? Alpha is separable, so uh, it's not a root of its, of the derivative of its minimal polynomial. R, rx, r prime, of course, reduces to the derivative of the minimal polynomial of alpha. So if it's not non-zero modulo pw, then its valuation has to be zero. Uh, so what? Uh, okay, so. Yeah, so. Now, yeah, let's look at this identity R of X plus pi W is equal to R of X plus R prime of X pi W plus B times pi W squared. So the, there are three terms on the right. Let's look at the valuations of these three terms. R X, what's the valuation? it's strictly greater than one by hypothesis. We are looking at that case. What's the valuation of this thing here? The valuation of pi w is of course equal to one and the valuation of r prime is equal to zero. So the valuation here is equal to one. How about the valuation here? This is at least two. So there's only one term whose valuation is strictly smaller than the valuation of all the other, all the other terms. And therefore that is the valuation of the left-hand side. And that's what is being said. The valuation of R, R of X plus pi W is equal to one. So that means that this is a uniformizer. No, no, not this, not this, not this. This is a lift of alpha. This is a, what is it? A monic lift of the minimal polynomial of alpha. And the one which is a uniformizer is R of X plus pi W. That's it. This is a uniformizer. Of L. Hmm? Fine, good. Okay, so the next proposition says that <clears throat> there is uh, an X in O W such that this ring O W is O V adjoined X is a polynomial ring in I mean, every element of OW is a polynomial in X with coefficients in OV. Of course, uh, it's not the same as the polynomial ring mm, because this X might satisfy some algebraic equation, some polynomial equation, but um, anyway, it generates OW as an OV algebra. That is the proposition. 
So here we are taking, uh, um, we are applying the previous proposition. We are choosing a pair XR such that X bar generates um, the field K, KW over KV and the value of R at X is a uniformizer of L, okay? And we have also seen that these EF elements um, yeah, so if X bar is a, is a, if we have this, then one X bar, X bar squared, et cetera, X bar to the power F minus, F minus one, these are what? These are a basis of K W over K V, okay? Mm, is it one or? Or instead of this, I, I, I could also take X, X bar up to X bar to the power F. And this, uh, this will come to the same. Okay, so they, they'll form a basis. Um, and now I have this uniformizer and we have proved earlier that this, these EF elements form a basis of this OV module OW. The, here it should have been R of uh, X, right. Okay, so uh, that proves this uh, lemma. And now let's come to some, yeah, we, we are going to start something slightly different. So before that, if there are any questions, I'll wait for a few minutes and then continue. Okay, if there are no questions, let's start some slightly different topic, a new topic. Okay. <clears throat> so now, first of all, we'll change the notation slightly. I mean, we'll adopt a better notation. So we start with a field which is complete for a discrete valuation, right? If the valuation was V, then we are using notation OV, PV, KV, and Pi V. Now, if we don't want to name the valuation, we just say that K is complete for a discrete valuation, but we don't want to waste a letter to name that valuation. Then we'll use this notation. The ring is going to be called OK. The ring OV is going to be called OK. Its unique maximal ideal will be called PK. The residue field will be called KK and a uniformizer will be called pi k. Hmm? So this, um, there's no, I mean, you all, there's nothing very difficult to understand here. And if I take a finite extension of k, and I know that there's a unique valuation w on k, on l, which extends v, but I don't want to, give it a name. So the ramification index, which I've been calling E W over K, uh, V will be simply called E L over K. And the residual degree, which I've been calling F W over V will be simply called F L over K. 
Moreover, in order to uh, avoid cases, yeah, I think if you do not assume it to be perfect, the residue field to be perfect, then it's much more complicated. And in any case, in our applications, KK, the residue field, will be finite and hence perfect, right? So for the time being, just assume that it's perfect. And here are some important definitions. Okay. We say that this L over K, L is a finite extension of K, K is complete for a discrete valuation with perfect residue field. L is said to be unramified over K if the ramification index is equal to one. It's said to be ramified if the ramification index is strictly greater than one. And it's going called totally ramified if the residual degree is equal to one. Hmm? The residual degree is equal to one. I mean, this is of course equivalent to saying that the degree of L over K is equal to the ramification index of L over K. And this is of course also equivalent to saying that the residual degree is, uh, no, not equal to one here, of course, is equal to the degree of L over K. Right? So one has to be slightly careful. If it is ramified, uh, or rather I want to say that if it's totally ramified, doesn't mean that it's ramified. Hmm? Because totally ramified simply says that, um, that the residual degree is equal to one. Doesn't say anything about the ramification index. But what is clear is that <clears throat> If an extension is unramified and totally ramified, then of course it's equal to K because unramified means that uh, E is equal to one, totally ramified means that F is equal to one and uh, this degree of L over K is of course equal to E times F and therefore if E and F are equal to one, this degree is equal to one and therefore L is equal to K. Fine. So the, this terminology is very important. Uh, unramified, ramified, totally ramified. In fact, okay, so we, we have some more terminology. Now let's denote by P the residual characteristic of K. So it, that, that means the characteristic of the residue field. It's also, goodness, what happened? Just a moment, huh? Yeah, yeah, here it is. So this P is also sometimes called the uh, residual characteristic of K. It's not the characteristic of K, it's the residual characteristic of K, which means the characteristic of the residue field of K. So of course, um, being the characteristic of a field, it can be either zero or a prime number. If it's equal to zero, if the residual characteristic is zero, then of course the characteristic of K itself is, has to be zero. Because if, um, if P times one equal to zero in OK, this implies that P times one is equal to zero in K, K. right? So <clears throat> if the characteristic of capital K is a prime, then the characteristic of the residue field has to be the same prime. But if the characteristic of, if the, if the 
characteristic of the field K, it's possible to have K, for K to have characteristic zero and for the residue field to have characteristic P different from zero. That is a possibility. Anyway, so if the characteristic of the residue field is zero, then the characteristic of your local field is also zero. But if the characteristic of the residue field is a prime P, then the characteristic of your local field, sometimes these kind of fields are called local fields, right? Then the characteristic of your local field is either zero or the same prime P. It cannot be a different prime. Hmm? Okay, so here is the other part of the terminology. I have a finite extension K of my local field. Hmm. So L itself is a local field. We say that it's tamely ramified over L. No, we say that L is tamely ramified over K if the ramification index is prime to P. And we say that it's wildly ramified if the ramification index is divisible by P. Okay, now if the residual characteristic is zero, then this has to be tamely ramified. Okay, this follows from the definition itself. And if it's wildly ramified, then the residual characteristic has to be a prime. I mean, it's, it's repeating the same thing perhaps. Okay. Now, if the residual characteristic is a prime, then this extension L over K of local fields may be either unramified or tamely ramified or wildly ramified. All three possibilities can occur. I mean, this possibility doesn't occur if P, the residual characteristic equals zero. Okay, now another thing which is uh, easy to check is what I've called the transitivity of being unramified and being tamely ramified. This means that if I have a local field K, a finite extension L of K and a finite extension M of L, this is unramified and this is unramified, then the whole thing is unramified. Hmm? That's easy because the residual character that, that follows from, okay, so these transitivities follow from the fact that whenever I have M, L, K, then E, M over L is equal to E, M over, this should be K. E, E, M over K, is equal to E M over L times E L over K. And similarly, F M over K is equal to F M over L times F L over K. So these two things imply these statements. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, So I have a local field K and a finite extension, finite extension L of K. Hmm? Sometimes well, this whole thing is abbreviated by saying that it's a local field. Complete for a discrete evaluation with perfect residue field. Okay. Now, here's a proposition which says that, so I have the residue field of K and the residue, the residue field of L. Suppose I have some intermediate field, K prime, between KK and KL. Then the proposition says that there exists a unique intermediate extension, capital K prime, between K and L, having these two properties. The first property is that it should be unramified over K. And the second property is that its residue field is equal to this given intermediate extension 
between the residue fields of K and L. Hmm? Okay, so let's prove this. So write K prime as K K adjoin A for some, is it A or is it alpha? One has to make up, so it has to be A perhaps. So there's an element A in uh, K prime, which generates um, K prime over KK, huh? because this is separable over KK. And take its minimal polynomial phi. So of, of course, because A is separable, uh, phi prime of A is not zero. Hmm? because it's a separable thing by hypothesis. Now take any lift phi, capital phi of little phi, which is monic and okay, that's it. Now this capital phi is of course irreducible uh, in this ring because it's, because it's reduction. Huh? Why is it irreducible? Because it's reduction. Phi is irreducible in K, what is it? So it's reduction, one has to say reduction modulo what? So it's reduction modulo P K is irreducible in the ring K, K, T. And why is it irreducible? Because this is uh, the, what is it called? It's the minimal polynomial of this A. So it's irreducible by definition. Okay, so phi is irreducible and is separable over K. It's separable over K and it has a simple root a in KL. Uh, I should have maybe considered this. I, I'm thinking of phi as a polynomial O L T. Doesn't matter. Okay. So then it will be reduction modulo P L or something. It has a root. Wait a minute. No, I mean, I think I, I can just reduce modulo PK. Any. Oh, well, PL is better. If you are, strictly speaking, if you are applying Hensel's lemma literally, then I have to take a polynomial in OL uh, and go modulo PL. And if I have a simple root modulo PL, then I can find a root, I can lift it to a simple root in OL. So by, um, so Hensel's lemma is being actually applied to K alpha. First you take an arbitrary lift, adjoin it to K alpha, and now apply Hensel's lemma to this field. So that will say that there exists some alpha prime in the ring of integers of this, which is a simple root, well, which is a root and which is congruent to the given root modulo the maximal ideal. So phi is the minimal polynomial of alpha prime over k. So if I take this field generated by phi prime, by alpha prime, then what is the degree? It's equal to the degree of phi, which is the degree of little phi. Hmm? And therefore, this is unramified because these two degrees are the same. So basically, I have found an unramified extension K prime whose residue field is equal to the given intermediate little k prime. Okay, 
but that's just existence and I have to show uniqueness of SK prime. So suppose I have another field K double prime, which is between K and L, which is both a namified over K and whose residue field is the same as K prime. Okay, then there's a lift beta prime of A in K double prime, again by Hensel's lemma, right? Then this beta prime is a simple root of the same polynomial phi. But uh, Hensel's lemma provides not just a root, but a unique simple root, right? In which lifts the given root. And therefore this beta prime has to be alpha prime and this k double prime has to be equal to k prime. So uh, that establishes the existence and uniqueness of, a, of an unramified extension of this local field, having any given extension of the residue field as its residue field of this unramified extension. Okay. <coughs> so, it's also clear that if I have two, if I have an inclusion of these things, then I have the inclusion of the corresponding unramified extensions of K. So in other words, now if, I, if my L and K are given, I'm claiming that there's a largest unramified extension, L naught, let's call it, of K in L. An unramified extension of K in L naught of now, an unramified extension of K in L, which contains every other unramified extension. And why is that? Uh, that's easy because um, you just take L naught to be the unramified extension of K corresponding to K prime equal to KL. Hmm? So we said I have K and I have KL here. There has to be an unified extension of K with residue field KL. That's what we have proved, right? In fact, we have proved it for any intermediate extension. So I take K prime to be equal to KL and I get an unified extension L naught of K contained in L. So the residue field of this L naught K L naught is equal to K L. And obviously this is the largest possible thing because everything else will be con contained in, um, the residue field be, will be contained in K L and therefore that unified extension will be contained in L naught. Okay. So uh, K is a local field and K prime is a finite extension of the residue field. Then there's a unique unified extension L of K such that the residue field of L is equal to, is isomorphic to K prime. So the difference between this and what has gone before is that earlier you were given K and some extension L, and then you are taking some intermediate extension and then finding a unified extension of K with this as the residue field. Here, you are not given any intermediate, any uh, extension to begin with. You are given a field K, you have its residue field, and then you are given K prime, and you, you have to find something here whose residue field is K prime and which is an extension of the local field K. So that's also possible. Uh, all you have to do is to write K prime as K K adjoined alpha or it's A rather. Then you take the minimal polynomial of this A over K K. Take a monic lift of phi, call it capital phi and it has coefficients in OK, 
in the ring, okay? And uh, the degree, of course, is equal to the degree of this residual, this extension, which is given to us, k prime over k. Did I say, yeah, it's a finite extension. And now take alpha to be any root of this capital phi and take L to be this field. Alpha is of course an integer in o L, is in OL because after all this polynomial is a monic polynomial with coefficients in the ring of integers of K. So the residue field of L contains a root alpha bar root of, um, uh, alpha bar is going to be a root of capital phi bar. Huh? Capital phi bar is equal to little phi. And because phi of alpha is equal to zero, this implies that phi bar of alpha bar is equal to zero. But alpha bar is equal to my A, which I started with. So, um, KL contains this root and therefore KL contains KL contains K prime, right? So, uh, now we have to prove that they are actually equal. But KL, it contains a root of a polynomial of degree phi uh, what is it? So, yeah. No, I mean, this, forget about this. I think this is not being used. It's clear that, you know, because OL I mean, after all, this KL is uh, OL modulo PL. So why do we have the degree? Why is this degree less than the degree of the polynomial phi? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so you have this inequality because KL is also e generated by this alpha, I think. That's why it's um, less than this, but that is equal to K prime over K, and therefore these two are equal. So you just have to, the equality of KL with K prime is just, a, you just count the degrees and you get it. Okay, so as I said, this kind of a field is going to be called a local field, your local field K. And now I take a finite separable extension of K. And suppose I have a K automorphism. Then sigma of OL, this is a K automorphism of the field L, right? Then it takes the ring of integers to itself and the unique maximal ideal of that thing to itself, right? So, uh, and therefore it induces, okay, so here, here is some explanation as to why this happens. So let's first look at that. So let's call V and W the valuations on K and L. And I have this sigma, which is not K automorphism of L. Then I look at W composed with sigma. So I have uh, L to L, which is sigma. And this then this W goes to R union plus infinity. So this is uh, W composed with sigma. 
one can check that this is of course a valuation on L extending the valuation that V on K. And therefore, since by the uniqueness of the extension, this has to be equal to W itself. So W of sigma X for every X in O L, I'll have sigma X and I take W of this, that's going to be W of A equal to W of X. And therefore, W of X, if it's an OL, it implies that W of X is positive. So W of sigma X is also positive. The, all this is to say that sigma of OL is contained in OL. And similarly, sigma of PL is contained in PL. Okay, so th th that was to explain these two things. So, I'll get a map from the automorphisms, K automorphisms of L to the KK automorphisms of KL, where KK and KL are the residue fields. Okay, and in fact, we are only interested in the case where the residue field is finite, and I'll denote by P the characteristic of this residue field. Okay, then if L over K is Galba, then we get a homomorphism from this to this, right? If it is Galba, then um, what KL is actually denoted Galba L over K when L over K is Galba, right? The residual here, it's always Galva because now I'm assuming that this is a finite field and every finite extension of a finite, finite field is actually a Galva extension. <clears throat> so the first um, proposition is that every unramified extension L of K is actually Galva over K and this map is an isomorphism. The Galva group of L over K is isomorphic under this map reduction to the Galois group of KL over KK. So how do we prove this? You write OL as OK adjoint alpha. Then this KL is going to be uh, KK adjoint alpha bar. So it is sufficient to prove that L contains all K conjugates of alpha. Uh, L over K is separable by hypothesis. And uh, we have to just show that it's normal as it's called. In other words, it contains all conjugates of this element alpha, which you adjoin in order to get L from K. So you take the minimal polynomial of alpha as the residual extension is Galva and contains a root of phi bar, it contains all the roots of phi bar. Because it's KL over KK is Galva by hypothesis, right? If the, ah, no, no, that, it's not a part of the hypothesis because this is finite. So every finite extension is Galva. Right? So then Hels's lemma will say that L contains all the roots of phi and so it's a Galva extension. Or rather, I mean, perhaps what this shows is that L is the splitting field of, of this phi over K. If KL is the splitting field of phi bar over K, K. Since it's a splitting field of polynomial, it's Galva. Okay, so uh, let's take an S in the Galva group of KL over KL and take a beta in OL. Uh, <coughs> 
So now what are we trying to do? We are trying to prove that uh, this map here is an isomorphism. First, we have proved that L over K is Galva. L over K, remember, is an unramified extension. By hypothesis, it's unramified, and the residual extension is KK, KL over KK. So we have proved that it's unramified. Uh, I mean, we have proved that it's Galva, and now we have to show that the Galva groups, the group here and the group here, there's the map is actually an isomorphism. So take an element in the Galva group of the residue fields. And let beta be the unique root of uh, this phi, which is congruent to S alpha bar, right? Alpha bar is such that K, K of alpha bar is K L. Now, so this beta is going to be conjugate to alpha, and therefore there is some uh, Galva automorphism taking alpha to beta, and the reduction of this sigma is actually S. So this map is surjective. And well, these two are finite groups having the same number of elements. Huh? Because the degree of L over K is the same as the degree of um, KL over KK. And so this group has order F, this group has order F. And if this map is subjective, then it's actually an isomorphism. So that completes the proof. Okay. And uh, yeah, here is one very uh, important way of constructing unramified extensions, you take any integer m, which is prime to p. So what is the situation? k is a local field, and p is the residual characteristic of, uh, I mean, it's the characteristic of kk, and kk is finite. OK. Take any m, which is prime to p, and take any unit in your field k and take any root of this polynomial t to the m minus a. When you adjoin such a root to the field k, what you get is an unramified extension. So that's what we have to show. This is the proposition. So in order to show that some extension is unramified, is enough to show that it's contained in an unramified extension of k. Because every sub extension of an unramified extension is unramified. Okay, so you take this um, extension k prime, which is the splitting field of this polynomial, but over the residue field. Okay. And so I've got this k prime and take this to be the unnamified extension of k corresponding to this extension of residue fields. So this by Hensel's lemma, k prime contains all the roots of this polynomial. And uh, this is what we had to show, right? We had to show that when you adjoin one root, you get an unnamified extension. We have shown that when you adjoin all roots, you get an unramified extension. So every sub extension is of course unramified. Okay, so I have uh, some five minutes left and then just I just need to summarize what we have done. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'll take them at this time.
So it seems there are no questions. So I'll summarize what we have done today. So we have a field K. It comes with a discrete valuation of rank one, which just means that it's not trivial, okay? Then you have the ring of integers of that field, I mean, of that valuation basic special. And the unique maximal ideal of this ring and the residue field, right? What's the hypothesis under which we are working? The, the first one is that the completeness, which means that this ring OV is the inverse limit of OV modulo PV to the N. Okay. And the second one is finiteness, that the residue field is finite. This is the kind of fields that this course is going to be concerned with from next week onwards. So basically, we will see that they are the same as finite extensions of QP or of or isomorphic to K power series T. Okay. So, or maybe we have already proved this, right? We have proved that if a field is the field of fractions of a ring, which is principal, local, but not a field, huh? with finite residue field, then it's one of these two cases. I think we have already proved this in one of the previous lectures. Anyway, so uh, what we have is that for every F, there's a unique unramified extension, un unique extension L of K, which is unramified over K and whose degree is equal to F. So we'll sometimes denote it by K sub F because it depends only on K and F, right? Uh, and this is actually Galva over K and the Galva group is canonically isomorphic to the Galva group of the residue extensions. And in fact, this is isomorphic to Z mod F Z. Actually, I would even go so far as to say that it's equal because it has a canonical generator uh, here. Because of this isomorphism, this, res, this gal, local Galva, the Galva group of the finite field has a canonical generator and therefore you get a canonical generator for this group as well, for this group here as well. So there's a unique sigma which has this property and which generates this Galva group. Okay. So here, here is a small uh, proposition which says that there's a unique isomorphism of groups which sends um, the class of uniformizers to Frobenius. Frobenius is this particular element here. You know? ah, this sigma is called the Frobenius. And what is the proof of this proposition? Nothing could be simpler because what this says is that this is canonically isomorphic to Z mod FZ. This is canonically isomorphic to Z mod FZ. I mean, a uniformizer, every uniformizer here goes to, goes to one here or one bar maybe one should say. Uh, the Frobenius element here goes to one bar here. And to prove the proposition, I'm also saying that there's a unique isomorphism of these groups, which takes one to one. And that is absolutely clear, right? There's a unique isomorphism from Z mod FZ to Z mod FZ, which takes one to one, yes? So basically this is Z mod FZ, so is this. And I think that's a good um, time to finish this lecture. So next time we will discuss um, uh, 
we will actually parameterize all timely ramified extensions of a given local field. So the base field is given. Ultimately, we want to understand all extensions of this given local field. And that is not an easy problem. Unramified extensions we have more or less classified today. We have said that for each degree, there's exactly one extension, which is unramified of that degree. But tamely ramified extensions are slightly less um, easy to, to parameterize. And that's what we will do next time. Okay. Are there any questions? If not, I'll end this session.